starts right now. The family and close friends of a 16 year old girl who was shot and killed over the weekend defying the stay home work safe order so they could honor her life today. Several people gathered outside her school for a vigil and balloon release remembering Miranda Martinez. The night team's Jaffney Gray has a story. For several of her Idea Public School Mustang classmates, getting the call their friend and sister, 16-year-old Miranda Martinez, was shot and killed Sunday was gut-wrenching. Despite the social distancing rules in place during the coronavirus pandemic, they paid their respects, gathering at a vigil held right outside of Martinez's school. When I found out how she was taken, like, it just it hurt. Like, I couldn't hold it in. I hear her on the phone crying, she's gone, she's gone. The shooting happened at the Rise apartment complex in Balcones Heights early Sunday morning. Police say they were on a call when they heard gunshots coming from the apartment complex. When they arrived, they detained 21-year-old Eric Hernandez and 18-year-old Kevin Clark, who were in a shot-up car trying to leave at a high rate of speed. Sadly, police later found Martinez with a gunshot wound to the head. She was a baby still. She didn't get to live the life that she wanted, become the doctor that she wanted to become, and prove everyone that she was prove everyone wrong that she could be somebody. Her friends and relatives say Martinez had a troubled family history and would live with close friends like Ashton Salinas. She was going through the worst of it and she made sure she stuck her neck out for the best. She was there. Her personality? Her Cardi B nose in her hair. <laughs> still brings <laughs> smiles to their faces. She always made the room light up. She was that person that everyone wanted around. As they laughed and cried, they joined in prayer, hugs, and a balloon release celebrating Martinez's life. Police say they still do not have enough evidence to charge the two men in Martinez's death, but her loved ones pray true justice is served. You took a family member, you took a loved one, and it's like, it's hard. Now, because Balcones Heights police say that they found two loaded guns, marijuana and shell casings in the car involved, Hernandez was charged with unlawful carry of a firearm and possession of marijuana, while Clark charged with unlawful carry of a firearm and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. Let's turn to the latest in the coronavirus crisis here at home. During tonight's daily briefing, Mayor Ron Nuremberg announced 1,652 confirmed cases. That's 39 more than yesterday, but 34 of which were confirmed from the Bear County Jail. 48 people have died. That has stayed steady since Friday, while 756 have recovered. Though the city is reporting a slowdown in the number of cases and deaths, they want the community not to let its guard down. Dr. Don Emmerich, director of Metro Health, says data showing a drop in the curve looks promising, but she warns don't be in a rush to go back to normal. State and local restrictions are still in place to maintain the drop in the number of infections. The mayor since, says since the new state and city order went into effect last week. There were 63 complaints and 34 citations issued to non-compliant businesses. While we have flattened the curve, we are over on the other side of the curve, um, but I want to just, again, give caution. That doesn't mean that we can go back to the way that we were back in December or in November. All of this work that you've done, that the decisions, the hard decisions that you have made, the advice that public health has given you, um, it is the reason why we've been, that, that curve has been um, flattened. If you believe you need to be tested and don't have a medical provider, you can call 311 to schedule an appointment. Yeah, you don't need a doctor's order. A local San Antonio development team is just weeks away from finding out if the Food and Drug Administration will give the green light on emergency use of a portable ventilator. The adaptable emergency ventilator created by the team Skunk Works San Antonio being tested with the help of University Health Systems. The night team's Patty Santos gives us a glimpse into how the testing is done and what's next for the ventilator. I think it's a really important uh, next step, if you will, in uh, assisting our uh, health care providers. Michael Jones with UHS is helping Skunk Work San Antonio test its adaptable emergency ventilator, or AEV. 450. He's using HAL, a high-tech mannequin. You can simulate a whole bunch of different things. It's as close to being a human as you can get without being a human. I'm getting 500 cc's. HAL can be programmed to mimic respiratory complications on humans like COVID-19, among other things. Jones says the ventilator's initial test 
test went well. We're very much near the end. It's just the final tweaks right now. Otherwise, it's fully done. Dr. Erica Gonzalez has been the medical consultant for the prototype team. Yes. She says after a couple of more tests, a dozen AEVs will be manufactured. Until we can get final approval, you know, for use, um, then uh, we won't be able to use it on any human until we get the final approval. Traditionally, FDA approval takes years, but the emergency use approval could take about a month, she says. But what happens after the approval is still in the works. The goal would be just to make sure we can get it out into the community to anybody who might need it where it would be useful. Both Jones and Gonzalez say they see its potential use by EMTs, field medicine, and even deployed military. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. If you'd like to read more about the development of this new ventilator, you can head to KSAT.com to read our previous stories. For 130 years, the Salvation Army has served our community by feeding families and providing them shelter. But the coronavirus pandemic is challenging the organization in different ways. At the beginning, the Sal Salvation Army created a plan to continue safely assisting the community, which included closing its building to in and out foot foot traffic. They were already serving 50 lunches a day, but expanded to dinner and weekend meals to meet demand. A spokesperson for our local chapter tells us they're now feeding more than four times as many people as they were before the crisis. The response we've received from the people that come by and need help there has been, you know, really overwhelming and people have been really grateful that we're doing this to them. Inside the shelters, they have continued essential services. Case managers are now working with residents electronically, and staff has increased the amount of cleaning and social distancing in the building. It's also worth noting the Salvation Army is not accepting drop-off donations at this time for the health of its workers and because some stores have also closed. However, financial donations are still needed for them to continue helping our community. Those can be made online on their website. At families across the nation adjusting to school at home amid the pandemic at the Sunshine Cottage School for Deaf Children, instructors continue their teaching online. Tiffany Huertas has a look at how parents play an important role in that virtual education. He's in that age group still where his brain is learning new language and new words by the day. Whitney Weaver says it's important to keep her three year old son learning during the pandemic. He has bilateral sensorineural hearing loss, and he wears cochlear implants. So we were referred to Sunshine Cottage when he failed his newborn hearing screening in the hospital. Gideon Weaver goes to Sunshine Cottage School for Deaf Children, along with his sister. Because of the pandemic, he is now learning through videos his teacher uploads online. Today we are learning about flowers. Guys. Holly Mason is Gideon's preschool teacher. She teaches three and four year old children. I record instructional videos every day and then send it to the parents um, so that they can view those videos at their convenience. Mason says teachers are also regularly communicating with parents online. We are shifting greatly to parents are having to take the primary seat. But what parents forget is that they were the first teacher. Parents are the first teacher their child's ever going to have. Whitney says there have been challenges. At this age, it's a little different because they aren't going to just sit down for an hour or more of online instruction. So a lot does shift to the parent um, to facilitate that learning. But Whitney says she's confident that with the resources the teachers are providing, her children will continue to stay on track. With the tools that Sunshine Cottage has provided, we've been able to continue that learning and implement the strategies and um, all of the language targets and everything here at home. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. The body of fallen Deputy Timothy De La Fuente was escorted by Bear County deputies across town to a local funeral home today. The 53-year-old died Thursday from complications caused by COVID-19. His death came less than two days after being tested. Jail officials previously said he had been assigned to work in a hot spot. That's an area of the jail where many people tested positive for the virus. We knew he was in a dangerous place, but I really didn't expect that to go that quickly. He wanted to continue working. He was very much into his job, into the community and helping. De La Fuente had worked for BCSO for 27 years. His funeral arrangements are pending. 
We are learning some breaking news tonight. I told you moments ago that the death toll in Bear County hadn't risen since Friday. We are now learning it has. For the first time, we are learning that an inmate from the Bear County Jail has passed away due to complications from COVID-19. That inmate has been identified as 66-year-old Clifford Childs. He was on in the Bear County Jail awaiting trial for some murder charges and was moved to University Hospital back on April 17th, where he passed away at 5.17 p.m. today. Again, this is breaking news into our newsroom right now, the death of the first inmate at the Bear County Jail, Clifford Childs. Of course, we'll continue to follow this online and on air and, of course, have the very latest on GMSA at 430. Every time this happens and we gather up together and come down here and show support to these victims, we're defeating the dang devil because we're taking over the, the ground. You might remember him, an Illinois man who spent many of his years making crosses and bringing them to the sites of mass shootings and other disasters around the country. Greg Zanis has died. Zanis's death comes amid a recent bladder cancer diagnosis he established crosses for losses as a tribute to his father-in-law, who was fatally shot back in 1996. Since then, he set up crosses at mass shooting sites, including Sutherland Springs, Columbine, Sandy Hook, Parkland, Las Vegas, Orlando. But it was these, this video from El Paso where he told us he'd reached his breaking point. Then after more than two decades of making crosses, he retired. Greg Zanis was 69. We got a new aerial look today at the progress being made for the new land bridge being built at Phil Hardberger Park. The bridge's support beams can now be seen over the roadway. The $23 million land bridge will connect the east and west sides of the park above Wurzbach Parkway. Park officials say the bridge will be 100 and feet 150 feet wide and was designed not only to be a unique and beautiful feature of the park, but also to help wildlife to traverse the park safely without having to cross a busy road. All right, now a heartwarming update to a story we first brought you last night on the night beat. Cameron Domingo celebrated his 10th birthday with a surprise parade yesterday. And after his story was shared hundreds of times, one Texas water park is granting his original birthday wish. Cameron, who has Down syndrome and difficulty eating, planned to visit Great Wolf Lodge this week for his birthday. His parents say because of the pandemic, their plans were canceled. However, Great Wolf Lodge Communications Director Jason Lasecki says they plan to not only deliver Cameron a birthday care package from the park, they're also going to give him a voucher for a one night stay to celebrate his half birthday this fall. Chulo, look at this stuff. How I know, I love it. That I is love so it. cute. Yeah. Still ahead on the night beat, the U.S. is taking more steps to lift some coronavirus restrictions, even as tens and of thousands of new cases are reported, forcing the president to revise his death toll prediction. Tonight, at least 38 states have eased restrictions aimed at stopping the spread of COVID-19, though most of those states have not yet met the White House's guidelines for doing it safely. And now meat prices are on the rise. Grocery stores saying they'll begin rationing. ABC's Romina Puga has more. As the country starts to reopen and states track their number of cases. Almost everybody is headed in the right direction. I think most of the numbers are coming down. We're, we're on the right side of it. At least 38 states are now easing restrictions. And in 17 states, the virus is still surging. Some of those states opening up have not seen the recommended 14-day decline in cases. But as quarantine-weary Americans return to beaches, parks and restaurants, the challenge now, how to protect the public. The New York Times obtaining a preliminary analysis about what could happen if social distancing rules are relaxed. In a report provided to FEMA, data put together by Johns Hopkins shows the number of Americans dying every day from the coronavirus could nearly double by June 1st, 3,000 a day. And cases could soar from 25,000 to 200,000 a day. The White House saying the government has not yet vetted the research, but the president acknowledged over the weekend the death toll could climb to 100,000. We're going to lose anywhere from 75, 80 to 100,000 people. That's a horrible thing. And now the U.S. accusing China of covering up the origin of the outbreak. It could have been stopped on the spot. They chose not to do it or something happened. Either there was incompetence or they didn't do it for some reason. 
And we're going to have to find out what that reason was. President Trump for days now saying there's evidence that it came from a lab in Wuhan, though the administration has not provided any proof. And in an exclusive interview in National Geographic Monday, Dr. Anthony Fauci saying everything about the stepwise evolution over time strongly indicates that the virus evolved in nature and then jumped species. Adding the scientific evidence is very, very strongly leaning toward this could not have been artificially or deliberately manipulated. And this week, some of America's supermarket giants are rationing their meat sales and raising prices. Demand for meat going up an estimated 40 percent, while production of beef and pork is down at least 25 percent, with outbreaks sickening thousands of workers at over 100 processing plants. Kroger's, Costco and other supermarkets now saying they'll limit fresh meat sales to two to three packages per household. In Los Angeles, Romina Puga, ABC News. Take a live look outside with live cam tonight. What is that, 82 degrees? But that's going to be kind of our high tomorrow. That would yeah, be nice, right? wouldn't it? That's going to be closer to the high tomorrow. So a welcome change for us in the form of a cool front tomorrow. I don't know about y'all, but it has been just unbearably hot outside the last few days. It's too soon for this. I think so. Too <laughs> soon. Brace too yourself. Soon. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, Del Rio hit a record high today of 104. So yeah, no, thank you. Let's go ahead and take a look at the time lapse. At least the sunset was beautiful tonight. 97 was our high in San Antonio. That is two degrees shy of the record set back in 1984. Uh, meanwhile, our morning lows have been steady in the 70s and that's not going to change tomorrow morning. You really won't notice much of a change in the forecast until tomorrow afternoon. So uh, don't be expecting that change until after lunch. Uh, here's a look at those high temperatures today. Again, Del Rio 104 beat the record back in 1984 of 102, 101 in Catula, 102 in Laredo, 98 in Yavaldi. Uh, even up in the hill country, it was sizzling 94 in Kerrville, but things have cooled down. It's still a touch humid though outside. Uh, 77 in Kerrville right now, 91 still in Eagle Pass, still 93 in Del Rio, 76 in Gonzales, and 78 in Pleasanton. Again, the humidity, it's very noticeable. Anytime a dew point is near 70 degrees, that's a summertime dew point where it feels like you're walking in front of a wall of water. Thankfully, that front is going to help to suck out some of that humidity uh, tomorrow. A wider view here with the weather setup, you can see all the rainfall across the Dakotas out toward the upper Mississippi River Valley and around Dallas Fort Worth. You'll notice that there's a line of thunderstorms starting to develop out there. That's ahead of that front, not totally totally noticeable until you turn on the temperatures and there you can see it's still 90 degrees in San Angelo, but that front is approaching Lubbock and now it's 78 there in the 40s across parts of Nebraska and South Dakota, 50 degrees in Denver. While we're not going to get down into the 40s, we are going to cool down uh, significantly. Like Steve said, our high temperature tomorrow is going to be a lot like the current temperature outside minus the humidity. But we'll take you through the future cast and you can see clouds will start our day uh, and I can't rule out a storm. I think there could be a stray storm around somewhere the case at 12 viewing area, but rain chances are very low, less than 20% tomorrow. So keep that in mind. Now that front will move through again right after about lunch, and then we'll see the effects of that cool front. Now it's not going to be cold, but it is going to be a lot cooler. 84 for the high in San Antonio, but notice in the hill country, the highs will likely only be in the 70s. And then Del Rio, which reached 104 today, 86 for the high temperature. Notice though that down near Catula and Carrizo Springs, it's still going to be hot because that front is not going to make it in time uh, before the day uh, before the heating of the day. So just keep that in mind. But around San Antonio, it should be nice and pleasant. So just to reiterate everything for you, a stray storm could be possible, but is not likely. And then we'll be warming up first part of the day will be status quo like the last few days. But with that front moving through, you'll notice that temperatures are just going to kind of steady out 84 for the high. It'll also become windy. Winds will be from the north gusting up to 25 miles per hour at times, and then it should be a pleasant evening. We'll stay in the 80s for a couple of days, warming back up into the 90s by Friday. But our next front moves through Friday night into Saturday. That'll make for a cool Saturday and cloudy with areas of light rain possible. Thankfully, those areas of light rain clear out and time for Mother's Day and it should be pleasant near 80.
Going to be a great week. Thanks so much, Sarah. All right. He's a member of Spurs royalty and yeah. his family feeling the effects of this pandemic. Yeah. In fact, two family members of Tony Parker overseas contracted the coronavirus. When we come back, we'll let you know exactly what happened to them, how they are doing right now. And also, NFL games plan of being played overseas and out of the country no longer happening as far as overseas. They're bringing them back home to the United States when we come back. Former Spurs star Tony Parker says two members of his family had the coronavirus and recovered. In an interview on The Undefeated tonight, Parker revealed that his father-in-law contracted the virus in Paris, as well as his sister-in-law also in France. Parker admits it was a strain on his family for two or three weeks, but since his two family members tested positive, they have now tested negative for COVID-19. Parker says during this crisis, he remained at his home here in San Antonio. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL has announced it will not play any international games this coming season due to the coronavirus. That means trips to London and Mexico are out. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell issuing a statement today as the league prepares to release its preseason and regular season schedule later this week. Goodell says he made the decision after talking it over with our clubs, national and local governments, the NFL Players Association, medical authorities, and international stadium partners. The decision to keep all games on U.S. soil this season will be so that the league can operate under consistent protocols focus on the well-being of players, personnel, and fans. The league had been scheduled to hold four games in London and one in Mexico City this season. The all-time winningest coach in the history of the NFL, Don Shula, has passed away. A Hall of Famer and two-time Super Bowl champion who became only the only coach to lead the Miami Dolphins to an undefeated season died this morning at his home in Miami at the age of 90. Shula won an NFL record 347 games, coaching the Dolphins the only undefeated season at 17-0 in 1972, beating the Washington Redskins in Super Bowl VII and repeated as champions the very next season with a 15-2 record with a 24-7 win over the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl VIII. That had been the third straight title game the Dolphins had played in after losing to the Cowboys in Super Bowl VI 24-3 in all. Shula guided the Dolphins to five Super Bowls, six total in his career, before he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1997 after retiring in 1995, finishing with that overall record of 347, 173, six ties, including his days with the Baltimore Colts. The Miami Dolphins issued this statement. It says in total, Don Shula was a patriarch of the Miami Dolphins for 50 years. He brought the winning edge to our franchise and put the Dolphins in the city of Miami in the national sports scene. Our deepest thoughts and prayers go out to Mary Ann along with his children, Dave, Donna, Sharon, Ann, and Mike. Hall of Fame running back Larry Zonka reflected on what Shula meant to him as a coach. He took us right to Super Bowl VI in two years. We went out and embarrassed ourselves in Super Bowl VI at the hands of the Cowboys. Cowboys kicked our butt. After the game, he closed the doors, threw all the media out, threw everyone out but the players and the coaches. And he said, I want every one of you to remember this feeling. He said, because we're going to use this feeling to grow on and next year we're going to attack this season and we're going to count on winning every game we're going to we're going to dedicate ourselves to winning every game and we did that the next year and we went undefeated that was don shula that was pure don shula that's what he was thinking he was driven he was motivated and he said we're going to win we've got to do it within the rules but we've got to attain perfection we've got to attack it every week like it's the last game of the year Jerry Jones also issued a statement today. He said, in part, Don was not just an iconic figure in the history of our game. He was an American institution who always represented the highest levels of character, leadership, and integrity. His name and legacy will serve to inspire all of the very best virtues of sportsmanship, competition, and achievement in coaches for generations to come. There will never be another one like him. The Dallas Cowboys decided to cut backup quarterback Cooper Rush less than 48 hours after signing Andy Dalton to a one-year $7 million contract. The Central Michigan product has been with the team since 2017, was a favorite among the players, but with $3 million guaranteed for Dalton, the former TCU product who was cut by the Bengals to make room for the national champion and Heisman Trophy winner Joe Burrow, someone had to go. Dalton, who was with the Bengals for nine seasons after being drafted by the team in 2011 did not leave Cincinnati without saying goodbye over the weekend. His statement said in part, I've given everything to the organization, the city, my family has given so much to the city. We didn't take our position and platform lightly to see what has happened since yesterday is bigger than football. We understood that. We know that we're feeling the love and it's bigger than football. To show their appreciation, fans started donating money to Dalton's foundation in $14 increments to honor the number he wore in Cincinnati. NASCAR is ready to race next. 
In less than two weeks, NASCAR will become the first major sport to return to live competition when they host their first race on May the 17th at Darlington Motor Speedway. During the shutdown, drivers and teams have been competing in the iRaces, the latest at virtual Dover International Speedway that was won by William Byron. His third iRace victory in four events so far, but all of those involved want to get back to real racing. Racing anything, whether it's a box car or, or anything with really an engine, is going to give you confidence if you're if you're winning. So it's it's a lot of fun for me. I've really enjoyed it. I've I've learned a couple things that I could tune with my driving style, uh, but definitely ready to get back in my normal car as well. And when live racing does resume, it'll be without the fans. Restrictions also imposed on teams and drivers due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It has just been something nice to see live for a change. Yeah, absolutely. And I bet the ratings will be huge. Out, out of this world. Yeah, yeah thanks, <laughs> sure. Greg. Greg. It's still ahead, big changes on how you fly. Many airlines issuing new safety precautions, which go into effect immediately. Plus, how the children's shelter here in San Antonio is helping families deal with some of the mental stresses that come along with the coronavirus pandemic. Major changes to flying during the pandemic. Some major airlines requiring all passengers to wear face coverings starting today. ABC's Inez de la Quitera has more on what passengers can expect. While some states begin easing restrictions, many U.S. airlines implementing new ones. United, Delta, and JetBlue now requiring face masks for all passengers, American and Southwest, following suit next Monday. Most people are separated. Flight attendants wearing masks. Most major U.S. airlines now blocking some or all middle seats for social distancing. One analysis of passenger behavior found if a sick person is seated here, those seated in the row in front, behind, and the two seats on each side are most at risk, with an 80 to 100 percent chance of infection. The rest of the plane has less than a 1 percent chance of picking up those germs. The airport seemed very clean. There is not many people here. Um, they are sanitizing everything. The number of people flying is slowly increasing, but passenger loads in the U.S. are still down 93% from last year. Airlines parking over 3,000 planes at airports across the country. The world changed for airlines, and I and I wish him well. Warren Buffett telling shareholders this weekend he sold all of his stakes in airlines altogether worth four billion dollars. Travel is not going to get easier. It's going to get harder and it's going to stay harder for years to come. Chief Communications Officer of United Airlines insisting on GMA. One thing is certain, which is that people are going to start buying airline tickets again because they want to travel to have those kinds of interpersonal uh, connections and relationships. Uh, that are just essential to what needs to be a human being. Starting May 6, Denver International Airport will also require all passengers and visitors to wear face masks. In de la Quatera, ABC News, Washington. Every weeknight around this time, we try to bring your coronavirus questions to the experts to get some answers. Tonight, we are joined by my friend Magali Chicano. She is a small business owner of Swab Development. She's on the city and county's economic transition team as well, and that's a team that's going to give their report to both the city council and the commissioner's court tomorrow. Magali, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Steve. What were the major factors you were looking at as a member of the economic transition team for the report that's coming out tomorrow? Safety, number one, right? So it was just making sure that we were following the the health protocols that um, you know were suggested also, um, so that was really our, our main concern and making sure that everybody, everyone was going to be safe and open. That's the balancing act in this whole thing, isn't it? The fact that you want, I mean, people aren't going to really come out if they don't feel safe. That's right. They're not going to. And, and so we needed to make sure that we were promoting that all over, right? Not only on the business side, but also on the, on the um, just general community. What are some of the ways that you make that happen? How can you make people, I mean, make people feel safe to come out to your businesses? Well, I think that what we're hoping to do is give um, give really uh, good direction based on sort of what the state has mandated and and great suggestions that I think the city is putting forward um, and really just 
you know, hoping that everybody really takes it seriously because obviously what we're doing is working and we just have to continue, right? Yeah. What can you what what do you hope people take out of tomorrow's report? That you know, that we just have to continue um, being really, I mean, I know it's, I'm repeating myself, but just continue being safe, right? I mean, continue with the measures that we're putting in place um, and just making sure that, that we're clear that this was something very important and very serious and we have to keep on uh, handling it that way, right? One of the questions that our viewers had are, what are some of the industries locally that have been hit the hardest? I think definitely the tourism industry, um, right? So I would say hotels, restaurants, um, and also I, I think the, um, the health and wellness industry, anything that's very high touch, right? So from spas, salons, I mean, they've closed. Gyms. Yeah, yeah absolutely, all of that. All right, I, did Governor Greg Abbott's reopen Texas announcement change the way the city county economic transition team uh, did its business. Um, did it change at all the way you looked at that transition team since he was very clear that the state supersedes what the local government can do? Um, I think it gave us definitely direction as to what, you know, I mean, what we had to stay within. Um, but I think that the that the transition team did an incredible job of um, you know balancing that and bringing to 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 the forefront things that San Antonio has been doing already um, as wonderful suggestions to continue doing. Are you worried? I'm talking. This is a personal business person entrepreneur question. Are you worried that San Antonio's economy will never be the same? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm a super optimist, um, and I I think it's going to be a slow, you know, climb back up. But I have no doubt that we're gonna we're gonna find our way out of this, and and we're gonna really end up okay. I don't think it's gonna be quick. I don't think it's gonna be something easy, but I think we're gonna be okay. I want to talk about web development now and how you are literally a business that, have ri that has risen from the ashes. I mean, a lot of people are gonna remember there was a, a huge fire on South Flores. I mean, it's a building I've been in before. It's a, it was a great building that you guys took over and then it was gutted by this fire. I mean, how has your business been recovering from that? Well, amazingly, um, you know, this was a Friday, the fire was on, on Friday morning at 10 a.m. And on Monday at 8.30, we were back in a new office because of the generosity of um, the community. And specifically, uh, Western Urban, Randy Smith sent me a text message and he said, you've got a space, how many people are you? And that morning at 8.30, we had desks and chairs in an incredible office space. Um, so we didn't skip a beat, really. And that was very fortunate because of the type of business that we have. As a digital agency, everything was on the cloud. Um, and my team was and is absolutely the most resilient, strong um, team ever. And we just moved forward. Um, so it didn't take much. I think it was much more of an emotional, uh, you know, shock of it all. And and then two weeks later, COVID happened. So it's been a whirlwind. And you, <laughs> where, so where will you, will you stay at the uh, at the Weston Center? Is that where you're at right now? Will you stay there or will you look for a more permanent place? We're actually Caddy Corner. Um, we're at the old, uh, I believe it was the old, um, Fraud. It's the it's a little short one anyway. Yeah. Um, but I think we're going to stay there for a little bit. We have to. We don't know. I mean, at one point, right before COVID, we were like, okay, well, we're going to figure out what where we're going to go and what we're going to do. And I think at this point, we're like, we're not even sure, right, what our next step is. So we we want to figure out how to rebuild where we were because we love it and we love Southtown and we're you know huge believers in sort of that area. And um, but. It's a big project. How did that lead to in this together? Did it have a factor in you wanting to do something for a community that had given you so much? 
For sure. I mean, I so two weeks after the fire, we actually decide to self quarantine. So we started even before the city mandated um, work from home, and uh, like a, a few days later, I I was so I was in distress. Like, how can I help all these people that have helped me? And I literally woke up on Friday morning, like week three after the fire, and I was like, I've got it. You know, everybody's asking for gift cards, but I can't I can't personally buy enough gift cards to make a, a dent in anyone. So how can I do it? I'm just going to, you know, sell something and then hopefully people will buy it and then I'll buy it in bulk. And explain, give back. explain what is the In This Together drive. So basically we've designed T-shirts, masks and stickers. And uh, people can go online to inthistogethersa.com and you buy. And 100% of the proceeds goes back to the local business, uh, food and beverage, and then health and fi fitness. And um, I buy gift cards in bulk. And so we've already distributed close to $50,000. And you've raised? 110. Wow. In, in, in 12 different cities. That's great. That's great. Thank you for that. Thank you for what you're doing. And uh, I appreciate you joining us. It's always a pleasure. And uh, give my best to your husband. I will. Thank you so much, Steve. All right. Take care, Magali. All right. Good night. Take care. We'll be right back. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and now that COVID-19 has radically altered so many lives, the Children's Shelter will begin live streaming twice weekly sessions for families under stress. One of its mentors who advises other dads is also a school district employee working from home with shared custody of his two kids. Jesse de Goyado says he speaks from experience in hopes it will help others. Single dad Justin Fincher, who has shared custody of his children, Hudson and Emily, has found taking them on short outings is a good way to make the best of life these days for all of them. It's really difficult uh, to to do an effective job for your employer and <laughs> and uh, manage the tornado that is kids. Still, he says they're a nice problem to have. The secret being patience. The first thing you need to realize is that you're probably frustrated at the same time that they're frustrated. For children like his who enjoy school, being at home must feel like they're fish out of water. The worst thing you can do is exacerbate an issue for a child by yelling at them, screaming at them, blaming them. Their kitchen, now a favorite place to be, to relax and have fun as a family, with lessons about measuring ingredients baked in. I think last week we had three pound cakes, so we're perfecting that recipe if anybody needs it. I really hope this is a time that they remember when they got to have just superb quality time with me. He's also hopeful someday they'll remember how their father dealt with a worldwide crisis. They'll be better adults and and have better lives than we did. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. The first Facebook session, by the way, is set to begin on Wednesday. Yeah, that's what I've been telling my yeah. kids about is the fact that you need to realize that you were living through a historic History. moment yeah. in the world yeah. where something like this is happening. And so probably one of the most historic in our lifetime, yeah. if not the most historic. And I've asked them to write down your memories or yeah. journal or whatever. They look at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> they, they'd rather do a TikTok. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, your daughters came to the station a couple months ago before all this started, and I was trying to get them to teach me how to use TikTok. Yeah, well, yeah. they are experts. I can't figure it out. I've actually done a couple. Oh, you have? Yeah. Are you a TikTok? Well, and now we're going to go search it. And <laughs> no, that's all right. You don't have to. Well, it was hot today it. across San Antonio, and it's going to actually cool down quite a bit tomorrow because of a cool front. So there's some good news in the weather, but let's go ahead and take a look outside with live cam. It's nice right now outside, 82 degrees, but that's about what our high will be near tomorrow. So even nicer tomorrow, but it is humid. Dew points in the uh, upper 60s near 70 degrees. Uh, so humidity at 70, uh, 65%, but we are seeing southeast winds at nearly 20 miles per hour. So we do have a good breeze out there, but this was the picture earlier today. Look at high temperatures across the KSAT 12 viewing area, 97 degrees in San Antonio, 
but a whopping 104 out toward Del Rio. That's a record for the day. Wasn't only hot here in uh, San Antonio, but up toward San Angelo, 106. But high temperatures struggled to get out of the 50s in the central plains, all because of a front, and that's that front that's going to move through tomorrow right around the lunch hour. You can see that right now, allowing for a few thunderstorms across the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just north of that. But by the time this front reaches us tomorrow, it's really not going to pack a punch when it comes to rain. We may only see one or two isolated or stray showers or storms tomorrow. So the best chance is for you not to see any rain tomorrow. Uh, south of that front, we are humid from those southeast winds off of the Gulf of Mexico, but that front is going to pull in some dry and comfortable air by tomorrow evening. But we'll start off the day tomorrow with areas of clouds and mugginess before that front arrives right around noon. And that's when we'll have that drier air settle into place. And it should be really pleasant in the afternoon, albeit a little windy. Take a look at high temperatures forecast around the area 84 near San Antonio Del Rio, which was at 104 today, only going to be near 86 and highs will only be in the 70s up in the hill country. So a nice and welcome change for us waking up muggy. But again, that mugginess will be gone in the second part of the day. North winds gusting up to 25 miles per hour, so it will be windy in the afternoon with mostly cloudy skies uh, and a really nice evening in storm. Then looking ahead, we are going to get a double dose of cool fronts this week. That front arriving tomorrow, allowing for highs to only be in the 80s uh, for a couple of days. Then we'll warm back up into the 90s by Friday, but the second stronger front will arrive Friday night, allowing for a cool Saturday, according to May standards. And we we will have the potential for a few uh, isolated light rain showers around Friday and Saturday as well. So that's our best chance for rain in the seven day forecast. Thankfully, we clear out by Mother's Day should be nice and near 80 degrees. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And coming up, we spoke with the man in charge of several local groups working to help our community deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. What those groups and Gordon Hartman hope to still accomplish next. For more than a month now, a collection of several working groups has been helping guide the community response to COVID-19. Today, Garrett Berger sat down with Gordon Hartman, the businessman and philanthropist in charge of these groups. He tells us what they've done and what's left to do. I think this is a historic uh, collaboration. It's been more than a month since Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf announced the formation of several working groups, but those days have been full. It doesn't all happen overnight. But I will tell you, it happens quite quicker uh, in times like this because it had to. As the COVID-19 Community Action Coordinator, Gordon Hartman tries to keep the various groups dealing with federal and state government advocacy, philanthropy, food, security and shelter, business and employment, and social services all moving forward. These working groups are not working in silos. They're all working with each other. Much has been done, he says, pointing to federal money that's come into the community, a telethon to help the food bank, and an effort to get high-risk and medically vulnerable homeless residents from Haven for Hope into a downtown hotel. And I'm very proud to say that no one at Haven for Hope, as of yesterday, has uh, tested positive. Hartman says the goal of these groups was to look at the need in different areas, potential funding sources, and look at the long term. A lot of that, he says, has been accomplished. There's still some more work to do, but I would have to say within the next 30 days that it would make sense for these working groups to wind up. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. It's a historic moment for the U.S. Supreme Court. The justices today started hearing arguments by phone for the first time ever. The court announced it will ask questions in order of seniority with Chief Justice John Roberts going first. If there's time, any remaining questions can be asked after the first round is over. The move signals the court wants to avoid a free for all and ensure an orderly process with as few interruptions as possible. The court will hear 10 across the next two weeks. The sessions will also mark the first time in history members of the public can listen in to arguments in real time. Vice President Mike Pence now saying he should have worn a mask when visiting the Mayo Clinic last week. The vice president made that comment during a Fox News town hall yesterday. It comes in contrast to what he said shortly after the visit, stating he was tested for COVID-19 frequently and always tested negative. The Mayo Clinic's policy calls for all who enter to wear a mask, and Pence and his team were made aware of that before the trip. President Trump, meanwhile, says he doesn't plan on wearing a mask while in public. Still ahead, Disney using Star Wars Day to make a huge announcement concerning the future of the franchise.
May the 4th be with you. And check this out. Big news for Star Wars fans on this Star Wars Day. Walt Disney Studios announced Taika Waititi will direct a new Star Wars movie for release in theaters. Waititi will also co-write the screenplay alongside Christy Wilson Cairns, and who, that's who penned the recent 1917 movie. Waititi recently won the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay for Jojo Rabbit and directed the first season finale of The Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. A release date has not been set for the new movie yet. And that's not all. The Force is also with Barbie on this Star Wars Day. Mattel is celebrating with four new dolls. The Ray doll offers a more fashion forward and less combat ready look than Daisy Ridley's character in the most recent trilogy. Then we have the Chewbacca inspired Barbie who sports a faux fur style. Then C-3PO Barbie coming up here. Hopefully we show it is emblazed in gold. <laughs> I love that. And finally, Barbie's visit to the dark side takes cues from the classic Stormtrooper uniform, replacing body armor with a tapered dress. I think you That's like MC. Pretty a, cool. I, I think MCing a fashion show is in your favor yeah. with the way you describe that. <laughs> Very smooth I, voice I, there. I, I love I love Barbies. Couldn't, yeah. Instead of yes. Chewbacca, Barbie, couldn't I just call it Chewbarbie? Chibar. That, that last <laughs> that one looked like one. Sia. So uh, tomorrow we true. are going to be seeing a stray storm from a cool front moving through. But it, all in all, it's going to be really beautiful outside because of that front, and then an even stronger front Saturday.